Good afternoon, Professor. Should I say good evening? Uh, well, it's evening, I guess. It's dark out. <laughs> but are you recording already? Do you want all this recorded? Oh, hold on. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, this is a program called uh, The Green New Deal. Um, our professors are Professor Marion Glenn and Professor Daniela. I know I'm going to say it wrong. Uh, Gisofefi? Fefi, Josephi, like Joseph. Josephi, Josephi. Um, <laughs> and uh, we're so glad that you were able to come to the program. We would appreciate it if you would remain muted during the program. Um, and then we're going to do Q&A at the end. However, if you need to leave for any reason and you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and I will get answers for you um, at the end of business, hopefully tomorrow sometime or Monday at the latest. So welcome both of you. Um, I know that um, Professor uh, uh, Daniela is going to be speaking first. So please, Professor, take it away. Thank you. Uh, my little talk here is called climate optimism because it's too easy to feel despair and hopelessness when pondering the ecological state of our world, let alone our political situation. And whether there is a chance for a Green New Deal, which Dr. Marion Glenn will explain. So first, I want to pump you up with some hope and two local pieces of good news because keeping hope alive is my message for thinking globally and acting locally to save Mother Earth. With climate crisis emergency upon us now, it's, it's hard to envision how the inevitable increasing warming won't bring even greater damage, suffering, and waves of extinction. For decades, political leaders have done little on national levels, pretending the problem doesn't exist. Oil and coal corporations and gas corporations have prioritized profits over the planet and our lives, wielding fleets of lobbyists and targeting campaign donations to secure politicians' votes against saving our climate. Now, after catastrophic droughts, fires, floods, and storms show clear evidence of human-caused climate crisis, one national party is totally against the Build Back Better Act, which includes a large amount of funding for climate mitigation. But that is not true of local politicians who are beginning to see the light in their local municipalities and communities. We have mayors and governors of both parties who are concerned believers now. More than, uh, more on that soon. I'm going to tell you more about that in a minute. In this dismal moment, Michael Mann's new book, The New Climate War, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet, offers a bracing splash of hope. Man is a highly respected climatologist who has taken upon himself the role of explaining climate science to the public. You've probably seen him on the media, Michael Mann. His message in the new climate war is that hope is necessary as we address climate crisis. Hope is also warranted because despite the evident and growing damage of climate crisis, humans do have the power to avert the worst of it by taking action in a hurry. In his expert view, we are already on the right path and just need to work together to speed up the process. His optimism is sparked by the global youth movement growing year by year. It gives me hope too that calls for governments to take responsibility and grant the young a future. Optimism is necessary because it alone is capable of leading people to believe in the efficacy of climate saving activism. People are not inspired to take action if they believe there's no hope. 
And Michael Mann, Al Gore, Greta Thunberg, and many others believe that there is still time to save us from the worst of climate problems. Hope is still justified. Much has begun to happen on local levels, if not national. It's our grassroots movements that count most now. We need to avoid both do denialism and doomism. Various exposés have shown that scientists in the coal and oil and gas industries have known about the impact of their product on the climate for more than half a century. But their corporate bosses chose to hide their findings and claim the opposite. Their roadmap was the same as the tobacco industry, but remember a fight that was finally won by activism, the tobacco industry fight. And we're now in the fight against those horrible pain-killing drugs, those opiates, and that is partially won already. Fortunate, and, and activism is what did it. So that's where we get our hope because fortunately, denialism is in serious decline owing to the annual extreme weather events we all see with our own eyes. Polls say that somewhere between 70 to 80% of Americans believe that climate, climate crisis is upon us and human caused. Now that denialism is conquered, the greatest threat to climate action is doomism. The belief that the end is near and there's nothing we can do about it. We've shifted from fighting the claim that it's not real to the idea that we're done for. And the, the fossil fuel industries want us to feel doom because then we won't do any activism against them. But doomism is a luxury we cannot afford while things are certainly grim. We do have the power to make a difference according to top climatologists around the world. We cannot restore the natural world of 200 years ago, but we can put the brakes on climate crisis and work to create a more livable planet, despite the entrenched interests of fossil fuel companies, oligarchs, and the politicians on their payroll. The rest of us are capable of fighting back and winning the climate wars, especially on the local levels. We need vision and hope to heed the call to action. I wanna share with you my own hope, which has to do with my being an old person of 81 years, retired professor now. And I wanna share with you the hope I have, which is more for my grandchildren and children than for me. It's a one minute poem. Oops, wrong one. <laughs> Sorry, got to get back to the right one. Can you see that video? Okay, I'll start it. Thank you. My name is Daniela Josephi, and I'm reading a poem called I Hope the Earth Will Remember Me from my book. Waging beauty as the polar bear dreams of ice. I hope the earth will remember me, that ashes of my spirit, my words, my love will live a new life fertilized by me. I hope I'll nurture the roots of a tree, feeling singing birds on its branches. I'd love to be heard in the song of a river as it flows through green, mossy forests. I'm glad all the water I drank will be recycled for flowers to drink in new gardens I'll never see, except in my dream of coming spring. Snow falls in my sleep now as I long for cricket sounds, nice, comforting music. I hope my aging calcified bones will nurture strength in children to be. I long for an earth of tomorrows where new beings might recall the good things we're made of, born of exploding stars in the mysterious life of sorrow, beauty, 
longing and love. To continue, can you hear me? Uh, so that's my idea of hope, that I'm helping save the, the earth and a livable planet for the grandchildren and children that we all love so much. We give our lives for them. And so that's why I continue with hope to be an activist in my old age. With optimism and hope in mind, I want to share a couple of positive local New Jersey good news stories. These are good news stories no matter where you live because it's stressing again, thinking locally, uh, thinking globally and acting locally. Just this past week, an organization called Empower New Jersey, working with local Newark activists helped to halt the go ahead on a polluting power plant at the top of an already environmentally stricken community full of asthma in Newark. The good news is Passaic Valley Sewager Commission was scheduled to vote last Thursday on a $180 million fracked gas power plant in the city's East Ward, which is already horribly polluted. Everybody's dying there of asthma and lung disease. And that 84 megawatt plant would be another polluting power plant in a community that already endures heavy pollution. Because of EmpowerNewJersey.com, made up of many environmental activist groups, Governor Murphy asked the PVSC to postpone today's vote after Empower New Jersey wrote and called relentlessly and demonstrated with local activists, the pause will allow the project to undergo a more thorough environmental justice review and robust public engagement process, ensuring that the voices of the community will be heard. The fact is much good work is going on, spurred by environmental activists in local areas and municipalities. And I want to screen share with you Empower New Jersey, which is something you can join if you haven't already. It's made up of many environmental groups. If you don't already know about it, because it's Empower New Jersey written out, not abbreviated.com, empowernewjersey.com. Let me see if I can share that with you right now. And let me first screen share. It always takes a minute to do this kind of thing. And now I'll share Empower New Jersey. Can you all see it? This is their Action Network page because they have joined the Action Network and if you scroll down on the Action Network Campaigns New Jersey, you will see what's going on right now. For example, this lobbying for clean energy, these various things that are happening right now that you can take part in. And because there's a pandemic that doesn't have to stop you right from your computer, you can still call from your smartphones, you can still call from your home phones. Uh, they'll give you numbers to call because uh, Empower New Jersey also has something called, let me see if I can open their other page. They also have something called, uh, can you see this now? It's, it's frozen, I think. Yeah, it's just a website that I'm showing you. It's, yeah, it's it's kind of frozen in mid. Uh, Can you see me scrolling it? No, it's it's frozen on my end. Oh, sorry. Well, anyway, all of these uh, various organizations are there and there's a petition you can sign. And we have something called. Let me just go back to my. Uh, uh oh, what did I do? Yeah. So I think you need to stop screen share for a minute. Yeah, there we go. And uh, right. what I want to say is that we have something called Moratorium Monday, where we all call the governor and say, call an emergency moratorium, no more new fossil fuel projects. So far, he hasn't responded, though he could do that with his executive pen. But at least we got him to stop the plant in Newark and stop a compressor station and some other things. 
I see that my friend there, Jill, already knows about this. She's shaking her head. But it's a great way for people in New Jersey to get involved locally. Even during the pandemic, you can call, you can go to governor. And by the way, since he was reelected with a small margin, he's been answering his mail for the first time. He never used to answer the mail and postcards we've been sending him for five years, but now he does. And we actually just last Thursday got him to stop the vote on that power plant in New Jersey. So local activism can work. And the way we did it is we embarrassed him because he had promised to not allow more environmental racism. He had even signed a law saying he wouldn't do that. So we called him out on his hypocrisy and he was forced because he had actually signed that in order to get voted in again, he had gone to Newark and signed no more environmental racism bill. And then he was going to allow the filthy plant there. So by calling him out on the bill he signed, we got him to stop it. But I want to share with you another very important project that is newer. And I'm only just learning about it. And it's called Pay Up Climate Polluters. Has anybody heard of that? I think this is a very effective way to go. Let me see if I can screen share that. Can you see that? No. I have to wait a minute. I have to go to the, just a minute. I noticed that even when I was watching some professionals talking, they had to, um, let's see if I can do this. Can you see it now? Yes. Pay up polluters. This is a website you can go to. This is the New Jersey campaign. Uh, there are campaigns all over the country, but this is ours in New Jersey. There'd be one for Pennsylvania if you live in Pennsylvania. It's called payuppolluters.org, campaigns slash New Jersey. And this website will tell you all about it and how you can join and get on their mailing list. And let me just try to scroll down here to show you some of the, uh, what they're telling us is that this is what it's going to cost us to mitigate climate crisis because New Jersey's a peninsula covered with shorelines. It's going to be 25 billion needed uh, to statewide flooding, sea level rise. Uh, it's going to cost 30 billion uh, for Sandy, uh, for hurricane, from Hurricane Sandy mitigation damages. And it cost 27 mil billion, the collective worth of 62,000 New Jersey homes. So the whole point is here is to make polluters pay this because right now we are paying for this with our taxes. No wonder our taxes are high in a community full of shore communities. So let me also share with you a very interesting video that it's, that's not the one, <laughs> just a sec. This is a very powerful. Can you see this? Yes. This is a. Uh oh. What happened? Hmm. Huh. So you can go to payupclimatepolluters.com. Let me stop the share here. And um, that I think is, a this is the most effective campaign so far. And they are covered by an organization, and it's bipartisan, by the way, it's not political. That's what's great about it, because we already have local Republican mayors involved. I was at one of their Zoom meetings a few days ago, and they already have 
people from Republican, Republican mayors and from local municipalities are involved with pay up climate polluters because they know that's what's raising the taxes and giving them no money for their needs to rebuild their shoreline communities and such, which are drowning and suffering. So uh, this is, I think, the most effective thing I've seen where you don't have to get embroiled in politics. It's covered by an organization that you can look up online, which made that video. And that organization is called um, uh, the Center for Climate uh, integrity. The Center for Climate Integrity is the nonprofit that covers the payback polluters, which has a campaign in every state. And we're much more effective suing on the state level, suing the polluters on the state level. We have 21 litigations already going, and the Union of Concerned Scientists has figured out exactly how much money to charge them because they can figure out with their charts and graphs, the Union of Concerned Scientists is involved in this climate integrity uh, organization project. Uh, and they are showing us exactly how to go about the litigation. It's all mixed up with lawyers and scientists who know exactly how to uh, make local municipalities plaintiffs in lawsuits. There are 21 lawsuits going around. And already in Massachusetts, they've won that these uh, Exxon could not dismiss the case. So the AG of Massachusetts is going ahead with that. So I wanna leave you now with uh, just one more very short video looking at the time. And this is also to give you hope. Let me just again screen share. Where's the screen share button, oh gosh. I've got to just, just a minute, please. Yes. And now let me open this little poem, just three minutes to inspire you so that you can listen with inspiration to the wonderful Dr. Marion Glenn, who will explain the science of things. This living being is Mother Gaia. We've seen her in photos from outer space. One big blue woman. We're all born out of her sapphire globe, gleaming with frothy white wisps of waves and brown and green patches of forest and farmland. When we viewed her life, recognized life, she emerged flying from the sun's explosion and spun herself into roundness in order to rotate endlessly journeying around the sun. A primal being without a mouth, legs, arms, anus, or genitalia, she sails around the sun, spinning us through active days into sleep-filled nights her moon creating tides on her watery surface. Hospitable regions of her land gave birth to many organisms and finally ones with consciousness issued from her. All individuals of her global community, we, all of us, her children, dependent upon her atmospheric balance and photosynthesis, fostering multitudinous varieties of consumable vegetation. Burning, acrid, smoking, spewing lava, molten glass from sand. It seemed that Gaia had no future. Who would have thought that from her loudness she would birth so many beings? Who could have guessed that from her flaming hot magma, forests, cities, songs, art, poetry, longings would be born? I am her humble celebrant. Please come hope with me, march with me, so that our children born of her womb will live together 
in harmony with her breath, breathing with her trees, in symbiotic balance, and bathing in her cleansed waters, tranquilly together, earthlings, suffered by her full-breasted bounty of brown earth and blue-green waters. Let's go to Dean from Dallas, Texas. Oh, Dean, you're on the air. Save us, please, Dean. <laughs> That's okay. That I have that all off now. I wanted to leave you with that hopeful thought that it's really the children and the future we're trying to save. And uh, I wanted to put all those different colored children of different cultures because right now our democracy hangs on the edge because of racism which is what the far right is really about. And it's so crazy to hate people just because of the color of their skin when people of every color have done wonderful things and are capable of great love and sacrifice. So thank you for listening. Thank you, um, Professor Daniela. There is a question from Jill. Um, she said uh, she wanted to ask a question about the Tennessee gas pipeline in New Jersey. Um, yes, that's one of the things we're working on. Maybe, uh, maybe our friend here, Jill, could unmute yes. herself and talk about yes. that. There you go. Thank you, yeah. Jill. Um, thank you. I don't want to take up too much time, but um, I'm on a on the Tennessee Gas Pipeline um, Committee with a whole host of people um, in New Jersey. Specifically, the um, the one compressor station is in Wantage which is Sussex County, New Jersey. The other compressor station is in West Milford in Passaic County. And we are fighting desperately to get these compressor stations to not be, to not have new infrastructure to make them bigger. And on New Year's Day, the Wantage um, compressor station, the Tennessee Gas Pipeline um, workers were working on the Wantage compressor station and they, they hit they hit something, they uh, hit a valve. I'm not sure exactly what the what the proper terminology is, but there was a gas plume that went all the way from Wantage, New Jersey, all the way to Orange County and Rockland, New York. And the Tennessee gas pipeline people were mum. They said nothing. They were not claiming that it was their problem. So what happened was um, the Rockland County and the Orange County um, gas, um, um, facilities they did an investigation on their own and they found that there was absolutely nothing to do with them it was all the way from the wantage compressor station from the tennessee gas pipeline so i'm wondering um what our our committee can do we are fighting tooth and nail to get this stopped um and unfortunately the passaic county commission they fight, voted against the resolution to stop this um infrastructure for the um, West Milford uh, Tennessee gas pipeline. And we have the mayor of Wantage and the mayor from Vernon and all the towns surrounding Wantage in Sussex County, they have all signed that they do not want this. Uh, fracked gas that uh, in, you know, coming from um, New Jersey, going to Pennsylvania and New York, there's a Westchester County Commission. They do not want this fracked gas and New York is trying to go green and electrify everything. So I what can we do? I hope that New York and, and Pennsylvania that saw the plume is going to make a lawsuit. But the problem is Sussex County is a very right-wing county. I used to live up I there. Know. Oh, so, I know. I know. I know. A lot of corruption up there. Yes. Uh, the politics of it. So yes. I, it, it's a fight, but I think it can be won. And I think that Murphy can put his thumb on the scale of that as well. And right. I think... We have to hit Murphy with bird dog Murphy about it to say, yes, I also want to add something else here about these gas pipelines. 
I was curious to figure out how many of them are exploding and killing people all over the country. So I Googled and I found out that even Fox News <laughs> reports on hundreds of these explosions all over the country. Well, maybe not hundreds, but many explosions of gas pipelines all over the country. Even Fox News is reporting on them and they're far right wing media. So right. I think that one of the things you can do is Google all the exploding gas pipelines and send those links <laughs> to or stories about those explosions to Governor Murphy, as well as bird dog him on moratorium Mondays or any day of the week, how he's got us right. this dangerous pipeline and or he, he, we're going to get sued. New Jersey's going to get sued by New York and Pennsylvania if he doesn't. Right. That's, Thank a, you. that's Thank you so much. That's a good way to go at it too. If 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 a if a state thinks it's going to be sued, um, and a governor and an AG thinks they're going to be sued, they may be more likely to step up to, into the fray. And maybe I don't know. I think so. I love you, Jill. We have to get together. <laughs> you have to yes, send, send me your email. Send me your email, please. I'll put it in the chat. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jill. Thank you for that question. Uh, Professor Glenn, I think we're going to move on to you, ma'am, if you would please um, unmute yourself. Okay. Um, there we go. I'm, I'm good. Thank you very much. So uh, thank everybody for coming. Thank you. And I am going to talk um, using some slides. And so I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Uh, and getting this slideshow going. All right. I'm hitting, oh, there we go. Okay, now let's uh, put this on slideshow. All right. right. So uh, can you see it? Yes. This phrase, the Green New Deal, and uh, also wave at me to tell me if my voice is coming through okay. All right. Good. Okay, thank you. So the, this phrase, Green New Deal, has been in circulation, especially in Europe, long before it burst onto the scene uh, in the U.S. Congress in 2019. Um, and at that point, uh, Daniela and I did uh, present a, a Green New Deal uh, in person at the uh, Parsippany Library. So it's great to be back here two years later to, to kind of give you an update on what's been happening. Uh, when, when this happened back in 2019, uh, a think tank called uh, the Data for Progress polled voters in every US county about the various policies that were being proposed. And they found that the majority of people, no matter what their party was, uh, no matter what state they lived in, the majority of people supported many, or if not most of the policies that were part of this Green New Deal proposal. Uh, that was before the Spinmeisters took aim and turned it uh, the, the Green New Deal into a hostage uh, of partisan rhetoric. So nevertheless, the logic of the Green New Deal, the logic has permeated policy discussions in the last two years and really transformed the way that we think about how to approach climate change. Uh, even though defining exactly what we mean by a Green New Deal uh, continues to evolve. So I thought for this update, I would spend uh, the next uh, amount of time, about a half an hour, uh, ex uh, going over what and why and how uh, of the Green New Deal. So uh, let's start out with a little bit of green. Uh, our civilization has sent so much greenhouse gas, mainly carbon dioxide, into Earth's atmosphere, and that's what you see over here, that's CO2, carbon dioxide. Uh, 
And that is a greenhouse gas which causes our atmosphere to warm up. And we have removed so many green plants uh, over the course of the years. And green plants are the main thing that clean up this pollution. So our planet is now like an overheated greenhouse and our Earth's climate system has been seriously disrupted. All right, now for a little bit of science. Carbon dioxide takes about 10 years to reach its maximum warming effect. So this carbon dioxide, which is being emitted here, is not going to be effective as a greenhouse gas fully effective for a decade, for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So even with all the climate disasters that we've already seen, we have not yet experienced the full impact of all the carbon that we've been continuously spewing into the air for the past 10 years. So we have still have 10 more years uh, uh, of, no matter if, if we stop now, we would still have 10 more years before the climate began to, uh, to equilibrate. The, there's a delayed reaction to this pollution and we can't expect any improvement until 10 years after we reach zero net carbon emission. So let's, um, let's talk about net carbon. I, I'm, a, I'm a professor, we got to get into a little bit of nitty gritty. <laughs> net, net carbon is the extra carbon that's building up in the atmosphere after the, all the plants and the oceans soak up whatever they can. That extra carbon is called net carbon. It's a balance between what goes into the atmosphere and what is removed mainly by green plants. To keep global temperatures from increasing, the world has to achieve and maintain zero net carbon for 10 years. To repair the disruption to the world's climate system that we're experiencing now, and that will continue to get worse for at least 10 years, requires that the absorption of carbon dioxide out of the air is greater than what we're putting into the air. So we, we don't have to completely stop putting carbon dioxide into the air, but we have to be able to lower it enough that the green plants can remove it faster than we're putting it in. And at that point, we'll begin to see the climate repair itself. So while we're waiting for the climate to improve, we have to adapt. We have to increase our civilization's resilience to face the disruptions that are already baked into what, what we're facing. But climate disruption is not the only problem that we're facing. There's a long list of other global and national emergencies in addition to climate events like job insecurity, income inequities, gun violence, racial and ethnic tensions, college debt, plastic and pesticide pollution, deteriorating infrastructure. Oh, and don't forget about the global pandemic. So the genius, uh, uh, oh, wait a minute, I, sorry, there we go. The genius of the Green New Deal uh, is that it sees all these concerns are connected and they can be addressed simultaneously. Climate, jobs, equity, all together are part of this Green New Deal. And these problems can only be solved with a system-wide New Deal. So uh, one, one of my heroes, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, says the Green New Deal is a request for proposals that addresses all of these challenges together. For example, infrastructure that we just talked about addresses both jobs and climate. Pension capital 
that I'll talk about uh, in a little while, can address both jobs and equity. And green banks can, can address climate change and equity at the same time. So what, what I'd like to talk about uh, is how some of these overlapping issues are being addressed through the ideas of the Green New Deal. Uh, the Green New Deal was a congressional resolution. It's not uh, a bill that will become a law. It's more a way uh, for senators and representatives to express their sentiments about the ideas. As I say, it was first introduced in 2019. It was reintroduced in 2021. Uh, and there were four main uh, policies, goals that the 100% uh, clean and renewable energy, living wage jobs, a just transition for workers and frontline communities, and do it all in the next 10 years. So uh, th this is challenging. Uh, and yet this is what the UN Committee on Climate Change has said we need to do if we're going to have a chance of, uh, of actually balancing what I talked about with the amount of carbon dioxide going into the air and what's coming out. So the Green New Deal is also an activist movement. And uh, here's a book uh, that's just come out written by the Sunrise Movement uh, a movement of, uh, that's led by young people uh, and uh, the, you know what, I can, I'm going to try to just get my gallery so I can see what this is. This, this is the only thing that can address the crisis at the, oh, I am, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, okay, I got it. Figure out how to get my screen so I can see it. It's our fighting chance to actually stop this crisis for some of us, the first we've seen in our whole lives. So these are people who were born after James Hansen spoke to Congress uh, and Congress began to uh, take this seriously before it got completely derailed by the power, the, uh, fossil fuel industry. The Green New Deal network uh, includes many progressive non-government organizations that have banded together to support this Green New Deal, the ideas behind the Green New Deal. So when we think about what's necessary to address global warming, we need a huge build out of renewable energy. We need a smart electric grid. Uh, we need renovations of a whole lot of buildings to make them more energy efficient. We need electrified transportation. We need new ways of growing our food. We need to plant millions of trees. All of this is infrastructure. Now, President Biden just signed a bipartisan infrastructure bill. And I want to look at how some parts of the Green New Deal have been incorporated into this infrastructure bill. So dozens of bills sprang up in the House of Representatives uh, as a result of the, uh, the Green New Deal resolution. There's a Green New Deal for cities. These, uh, the, these are all right now in various committees of the House being discussed and, and debated and worked upon. There's a Green New Deal for public housing. There's a Civilian Climate Corps proposal. And there's the Thrive Act to transform, heal, and renew by investing in a private, vibrant economy. So th these are some of the dozens of bills that have sprang up uh, as a result of the ideas and the goals that are in the Green, green New Deal. And some parts of each of these bills has actually appeared in the infrastructure bill that the president signed. For instance, there is support for renewable energy, for clean energy jobs, for reduced emissions at ports and airports. There is money for electric school buses and public transport. 
Uh, there's money for the smart electric grid, for technology to, to develop that, for EV charging stations, for more passenger rail lines, for a phase out of toxic chemicals, uh, for a way to cap orphaned oil and gas wells so that they are not, sorry, uh, let's see, I don't think I can. <laughs> All right, I'm, I've, I've switched to the next uh, slide. Let's see if I, there we go. There we go. Uh, oil and gas wells, which, um, which are leaking methane. So this is a way, methane is another greenhouse gas that's extremely potent. There's money to remove lead water pipes and to clean up Superfund sites and brownfields, many of which are in frontline communities. So some, I, I think this, uh, again, gives us hope because although the, the Congress was stuck on actually passing the, the bills that the Green New Deal resolution uh, had led, ha, had, had sprung up as a result of it. Uh, some parts of each of those bills was in the infrastructure bill. Now, as, as you probably remember, the, uh, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party agreed that they would separate the infrastructure bill from the Build Back Better bill. Uh, and that bill, that Build Back Better bill, is now stuck in negotiations. Uh, I, I wanted to just, uh, before we get to the Build Back Better bill, show you a few Green New Deal policies that were in the infrastructure bill through a Republican Party lens. Uh, so one of the questions you can ask about infrastructure is, are these jobs that uh, will be created by the infrastructure bill, are they going to be good jobs? So uh, the, the infrastructure bill requires states to negotiate benefits through collective bargaining agreements. It creates, a, now remember this is, this, this is the Republican uh, complaints about the bill. It creates a $250 tax deduction for union dues. Oh, well that allows union bosses to increase their dues. Uh, and it allows the electrical ve electric vehicle credit only for union made vehicles. So these are ways that the uh, ideas of the Green New Deal for creating good jobs has actually found its way into the infrastructure bill. Uh, a couple of more, uh, th this came from the House GOP uh, website uh, concerning this, uh, th this bill. Uh, and they are complaining that it provides 38 billion in subsidies to green energy special interests to advance radical elements of the Green New Deal under the guise of addressing air pollution. Well, who's in favor of air pollution? <laughs> uh, it includes billions of dollars to, to states to advance Green New Deal policies through com community climate incentive grants. Exactly what Daniela was talking about, how local activities are the way to address climate if, if it's stuck at the national level. And uh, then here was another critique. It increases our energy prices even more by funneling most of our money into renewables and ignoring clean and reliable fuel sources like nuclear energy and natural gas. Well, that's, uh, that's an opinion. So. Data for Progress, this uh, think tank, asked voters about the Build Back Better bill as it was being introduced. And they surveyed congressional districts in eight frontline areas. Uh, this included frontline districts that were kind of uh, in, in, on the pivot between, uh, the, these are the battleground areas between the Republicans and the Democrats. But a majority of voters in each of these districts said that it was important for Congress to make additional investments beyond the bipartisan infrastructure bill to combat climate change and create clean energy jobs. And there, there was strong voter support specifically for improvements to energy efficiency, lowering the cost of electrical vehicles, phasing out subsidies for fossil fuels and support for clean energy. So uh, the, the people in these frontline districts uh, ha have, uh, 
they have opinions in support of the Build Back Better bill. Uh, right now, it's, it's stuck uh, because of uh, disagreements within the Democratic Party itself. Let's hope that they can work something out. So in general, in the last two years, the politics of climate are changing. In 2020, voters across party lines grew more concerned about the impacts of climate change. And you notice that uh, in that uh, infrastructure bill, there, there were 11 Republicans who voted for that. That's the only way that it got passed. Uh, and uh, they understand that we have to do something to, uh, to help the resiliency of the country because the climate is getting so disrupted. With Congress gridlocked, states and cities are taking up Green New Deal goals. So the Green New Deal has kind of permeated uh, our society and people's thinking. And the, the logic of it is showing up now at the state and the local level. And financial companies are addressing investment risks from climate change. So the, the, these are financial companies that are handling investments uh, in the trillions of dollars. For example, the S&P Dow Jones indices now have a carbon scorecard. Uh, this is the data from 2019. And you can see that they're, they're looking at the carbon footprint uh, of the investments. The reserve emissions, that, that means how much uh, fossil fuels are in the ground that these companies, the, the companies in these different funds, uh, the, what, how, how much they would emit carbon dioxide if those reserves were actually burned. Uh, their coal exposure and coal has been the first, it's, it's really the dirtiest of our fuels. And it's been the first one that activists have been successful in, uh, in closing down coal plants. Uh, how are they doing as far as the energy transition to renewable energy? Are they making investments in renewable energy? And uh, what's their risk exposure if there were to be a price on carbon? In other words, if a, a carbon tax uh, were implemented. And th this, this is the sad part. None of these funds that are listed, and you can look over here and see the names of all these uh, different ones. None of them is actually uh, reduces their carbon emissions enough to align with the two degree, uh, the, the necessity for emission control in order to keep climate change below two degrees. So e even though these funds uh, are, one of them is called the fossil fuel free index, there's the carbon price risk adjusted index. There's the carbon efficient index. So these are all uh, indices which are uh, associated with trying to, to reduce carbon risk. And yet none of them is really effective at the level that's needed in order to keep the global warming below two degrees. So that, that's a kind of wake up call that we have a lot of work to do. I wanna talk a little bit about the New York State uh, Pension uh, Company, which is called the Common Retirement Fund. They have $185 billion uh, that they're managing for New York State pensions. And they have, their board has decided to transition to 100% sustainable assets by 2030. Uh, and in 2021, they divested all of their holdings from thermal coal. Uh, so the, uh, the, these were holdings that, that uh, were sort of individual asset. By thermal coal, they mean coal that's being used to generate electricity. And then they developed a restricted list which prohibits further purchases of carbon intensive fossil fuel holdings that include companies that have more than 0.3 gigatons of potential carbon dioxide emission from th their thermal coal reserves, or companies with more than 20% of their revenue from oil and gas, 
or companies that derive more than 10% of their revenues from activities related to oil sand. So they've looked at some of these carbon intensive companies and decided all the, these will be uh, on the, they're not gonna invest anything more in them. And meanwhile, they're gonna engage with these companies on the restricted list about their climate transition plans. In other words, what are they doing to reduce their carbon footprint? And uh, the, the New York um, Pension Fund will participate in uh, a group called the Value Reporting Foundation Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. That's a mouthful. Um, but that's a board that is trying to support the global adoption of environmental, social, and governance sustainability reporting standards. So to, to make it a standard policy for companies and funds to report the, those uh, the different um, levels of standards. Now, uh, so that was the New York State Pension Fund. Altogether in the US, pension funds have about $8 trillion invested in fossil fuels. And I, I just thought it was very interesting that the cost of a 20 year rollout of renewable energy and smart grids is about $9 trillion. So here, here's a very nice matchup. Uh, and the, the, uh, the, there's a good reason to think about for a pension fund to invest in infrastructure in their local communities. It's a direct benefit to the members of the pension plan who live there. And the investments can be set up to favor union jobs and to guarantee good wages. So here's a way that this US, uh, these US pension funds can actually be involved in implementing some of the goals of the Green New Deal. And the matchmaker uh, for all of this are what, what is called green banks. Uh, they're popping up all over and uh, including in New Jersey. And I'll talk about that uh, in a little while. So I, I'd like to just finish up by talking about how the uh, Green New Deal is playing out in New Jersey. So uh, first of all, New Jersey joined the Northeast states in a carbon cap and trade uh, organization called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And every year there's an auction uh, and the New Jersey actually sells the right to a certain amount of pollution to other states because our uh, energy generation in New Jersey is cleaner than theirs. So we, we have less pollution than this regional green, the, but by the way, the level of pollution goes down every year, the level that you're allowed. Uh, and then states which uh, have more pollution than New Jersey will pay us because uh, we, we own those credits. So the New Jersey Green Bank is one of the beneficiaries of these funds. And that means there'll be a fund that will be available to incentivize private lending in underserved areas. So a, a commercial bank may not be enthusiastic about lending uh, in, in uh, some of our areas in the state and the green bank would be able to underwrite some of the risk using this money from the regional greenhouse gas uh, auction funds. That money will be used to electrify transportation in the states, and 10% of the funds will go toward forests, urban forests, and salt marshes where carbon can be sequestered under the ground. So this is all part of the, uh, the funding plan, which uh, covers the years from 2020 to 2022. Every year, there uh, are millions of dollars in auction funds that come to the state, and, and this is how they'll be used. Just uh, a little bit of detail here. These REGI funds include some of the Green New Deal goals. And if you look at the objectives of how, how they're gonna decide uh, who gets the funds, 
the, there are four, these four different initiatives that I just mentioned. So to catalyze uh, equitable, clean, equitable transportation, to promote what they call blue carbon in coastal habitats, that, that's the uh, salt marshes, to enhance forests and urban forests. So these two initiatives together get 10% uh, of the funds and to create a New Jersey Green Bank. So it, the um, catalyzing the equitable transportation uh, had the most, the, the C stands for critical. It's not, uh, it's not a grade A, B, C, D. C stands for critical, B stands for, for beneficial, but not completely critical. So this first initiative had the highest number of matches uh, to the objectives of the plan. And so that's the one that uh, got funded for the first year. And these other, every year 10% of this, no matter what, goes to initiatives two and three. And then the Green Bank, uh, well, they're, they're working on it and that should be uh, funded in the next year or so. So the, again, the Green New Deal goals are being applied at a state level. Uh, another thing that happened in New Jersey is we got money from Volkswagen because they had cheated on their uh, air quality measurements. And so uh, I, I just thought it would be fun for you to see how that, um, how that money was used. So here on this map, you can see uh, that uh, there were four electric trucks for Hudson County. The city of Jersey City got five electric garbage trucks. Uh, all kinds of things that took place in and around Newark. The city of Trenton uh, got five electric school buses. New Jersey Transit got some uh, eight electric transit buses and, and uh, five electric box trucks and four electric terminal tractors uh, uh, here in Burlington County. So. Uh, th this was uh, all awarded uh, as a result of the funds from that Volkswagen mitigation. That was the first year. Then there was the second year and more school buses, uh, more uh, electrification of the port, uh, which uh, it has been one of the high priority items because uh, our, our Department of Environmental Protection has a program called Stop the Soot. Uh, and the idea is to convert as many diesel machines uh, into electric. And, and so around the port, this, this will really help the air quality there. Uh, electric trucks, electric transit buses, and so on. You see that uh, th things are actually happening uh, because New Jersey had an energy master plan that called for 300,000 electric vehicles on the road by 2030. So uh, we're getting there. Uh, just to finish up, what can you do? And Daniela has, uh, has uh, covered Empower New Jersey. I guess uh, there'll be a copy of this PowerPoint will be uh, available through the library. So you can, uh, you can check out more of these. I don't know if the, well, the, the links are live on my PowerPoint, so I imagine they would be uh, when you get that PowerPoint online as well. So Jersey Renews uh, is a, another group. It's a coalition of uh, organizations that is uh, interested in environmental justice and clean renewable energy, good jobs, protections for workers and communities. Uh, and they've got an online petition that you can sign uh, the Green Amendment is something that was started by the Delaware River watershed. Um, and this is, uh, so, so far has managed, we've managed to keep fracking out of the Delaware River watershed. Uh, New York has passed this Green Amendment. In New Jersey, we need 24 votes for it to pass the Senate. Right now, there are 19 Senate sponsors. We need 48 votes to pass it in the assembly and there are 43 sponsors. So uh, this is, is something that, uh, again, you can contact your representative and see where they stand on this and encourage them to get behind it. Governor Murphy, you can call as uh, Daniela said, 
support moratorium Mondays, here's the number. Uh, and the receptionist is very friendly and cordial. And I think, you know, she's used to, oh yes, it's Monday, it's those people. Uh, but they will record the fact that you called and uh, what, what you are supporting. So it's really worth doing and it's easy and it makes you feel great. Finally, uh, this being a library, I thought uh, I would just put up some of the books that I uh, have found to be inspiring and informative. Uh, by the way, this one right here, Daniela Josefi's book of poetry, Waging Beauty as the Polar Bear Dreams of Ice. Uh, you can read some of her other poems about global warming. Uh, the, this whole new Green New Deal idea really goes back to 1988, our common future, a United Nations report where the term sustainable development first appeared. Uh, and so this was before the climate issue became uh, par part of the discussion. This, this was just looking at uh, equity in terms of development and how to make development sustainable by uh, giving people uh, the opportunity to have good jobs. The next, it, the next year, Bill McKibben came up with the, the first uh, book about global warming for the general public called The End of Nature. So we, we have been at this now for, for 40, more than 40 years uh, from, the, no, that's, that's thir more than 30 years. <laughs> and we've got another 10 before the window closes shut tight. Uh, this is the Pope's uh, encyclical on care for our common home, uh, where again, uh, many of the ideas of the Green New Deal, uh, looking at uh, the dignity of work and, and the importance of protecting uh, our home, planet, and each other. Uh, this is a, a very recent book, which uh, I found to be uh, very thought provoking. It's written by a young man in New Jersey, uh, Daniel Shirell. Uh, he, he grew up, whoops, he grew up in New Jersey uh, and uh, he is an activist. He works for uh, right now for New York uh, environmental justice organization looking at union, unionized jobs. He was responsible for New York passing uh, their global warming legislation. A and uh, he, he has a kind of philosophical uh, approach to acknowledging our grief and yet remaining active in, in trying to uh, mitigate the problem. Here's the book that Daniela mentioned, The New Climate Wars, uh, War Over Here by Michael Mann, Winning the Green New Deal, which I showed you at the beginning. Here's another book about the Green New Deal by Jeremy Rifkin, who has been working on Green New Deals in Europe and in China. So he is extremely uh, familiar with how you get there. The Uninhabitable Earth, uh, the, this is a wake up call. And then this is the United States fourth national climate assessment. So you can see what the US global change research program uh, has come up with uh, for what's happening in the US. So that's, um, that's it for me. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, Professor well, Marion, could you please uh, go back to the slide that had uh, Governor Murphy's phone number in it. Please. There we go. That's great. There we go. 866-586-4069. And that's what we use for moratorium Mondays so that the uh, Empower New Jersey will count how many calls are going as well. So you'll first get them and then they'll put you to the governor's office. Okay. Yeah, they, um, they actually come on the line when you dial that number um, okay. and, and give you, uh, uh, you know, you can just give you a little background to talk about. Uh, and then they connect you with Governor Murphy's office. They tell you exactly what to say. So it's easy <laughs> <laughs> you can paraphrase to be more original, but 
it's a great way to go to keep him on his toes. Uh, I, he, he has been responding. He has more than he used to. But there's, well, I won't say there are rumors that he used to be invested in a lot of natural gas, which we no longer call natural gas. We call it fracked gas. And mm -hmm. we don't talk about climate change. We call it climate crisis. Because as a poet, I know that words have emotional value. And it's important to say climate crisis and fracked gas more than climate change or natural gas. Natural gas sounds way too sweet. <laughs> sounds too natural. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so I do actually have a question. Um, it, it's about uh, what is a green bank? What exactly is a uh -huh. green bank? Okay, so a green bank uh, has uh, funds that can be used for uh, certain green projects uh, in communities where commercial banks would not be uh, interested in in, in making investments. Mary, so, stop the screen share. I'd rather see your beautiful face yeah, than- Okay, I'm gonna stop the share. There okay. we go. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, now. so for example, let, let's imagine that um, there was a community that wanted to do a, a community uh, solar project so that people who couldn't put solar panels on their own roofs could join a, a community solar project. Okay. Uh, and so the, this bank could provide financing for that project to take place. Okay. And so I think it, that it, they, it could provide both grants and, and matching funds. Um, and th these uh, sorts of banks are kind of popping up all around the country where uh, it, it, again, it's a way to address the fact that the commercial banks uh, have strict criteria about who they will lend to. And so that's preventing people from uh, going green that might want to. And the, these banks will be able to help with that. They'll be able to help. And I know, I think Jill, you have your hand up. You have a question? Yes, I just want to know um, when we're going to do this again, because this was just absolutely fabulous. And, you know, there are so many um, webinars that I'm on about the topics that were discussed. and. I just feel like um, both of you are just so passionate and you're not reading from a script. This is in your heart and your soul. And there's so many webinars that I just sit there and I'm like falling asleep. And, and I just think both of you, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. Obviously everybody on this just is totally on board with what you're saying. And I would love to have you two present again. I, I just find you two absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. One You're thing, welcome. I'd like to say the same thing. I'd like to see a hundred people on the screen here. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Me too, Merle. Me too. Oh, really? Me too. The information. I've been writing very fast and my arm is starting to hurt. <laughs> yeah, same with me. Same with me. Thank you so very much. And, and again, I was thinking, I wish I'd recorded the whole thing. But so that's I okay. That's okay because you can go on the Parsippany YouTube channel and you can stop and start and stop and start just to hear what both of these um, fabulous professors have put together for us. So you can absolutely do that. Um, if you uh, can't find the channel for whatever reason, you can call me at the Parsippany Library. I'll, I'll absolutely help you out there. And I, I'd be happy if you have questions that come up or you want to continue the discussion. Um, sure. That then uh, you can contact me. To, I don't know if my email was on the. Um, your your but, email is not on the um, on the flyer that I put out, um, but I don't have an issue if anyone wants to contact me at the Parsippany Library, giving um, either professors emails if that's okay with both of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fine. Chat. Can you, you want to put it in the chat? I did put it in the chat, but somehow my chat I think only went to Merle. I have yeah, to. Get I didn't see it. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll put yeah, that in. It probably because I wrote you a message. It was probably, uh, you, yeah, you have to put it then on everybody after that. Right. So you have to put it on everyone in the meeting too, and then type it in there. When you go into the chat, you'll see okay. you have a little pull there down. We go. 
Okay, now I'll put it here. I'll put okay. my email here. Oh, really, there it is. Marion.glenn at shu.edu. Right, that's Seton Hall University. Right, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, um, thank you all for your patience uh, as you know, one slide after another late into the night, <laughs> so. I think personally, uh, both of you are excellent presenters and at no point was I dragging through any kind of slides. They were just the right amount of information for me to process and go, this is where I need to center my thoughts and my activism. So thank you both very much. I thought it was an excellent, excellent presentation. Um, okay. Also, I just want to say real quick, um, both of you being being um, in the line of work that you're in, I'm just learning that we just don't have this educational piece in our schools, whether they're elementary, middle, high school, college, university level. Why is more of this not in our curriculum and why are we not teaching this to every student that is in a classroom whether it's physically in a classroom or virtually why are we not getting this out there like crazy right now well look what's happening in some states where people don't even want to teach the history of slavery or women's rights <laughs> right yeah. very good point we're at a very difficult time but I know that the schools here in New Jersey, at least in, well, South New Jersey, believe it or not, hate groups and Ku Klux planners. If you go to this uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, you can, they pr publish a map uh, and it's SP. You know, I tried to click everyone in the chat and it won't let me, it keeps going to Merle only. Uh, oh. I tried very hard. So, so Merle, send her email address from your e from your little spot there. I have it. I have it. I can put it in. Um, Thank you. So I Jill, I just wanted to mention that at Seton Hall, uh, the most popular major for edu students that are going into elementary and middle school education is environmental studies. Wonderful. So it's a, it's a very popular major among our education Great. students. So there, there's hope for the future. And my That's grandkids who are only 13 and 16 have been being educated on environmental issues from preschool practically. And the Maplewood schools are pretty good about this because we're a very uh, diverse town with a gr good green team. And we had some of the first uh, electric charging stations. But I was about to say, if you go to flacenter.org, the Southern Poverty Law Center, you can click on a map that tells you where the hate groups are. They're all over the country. Some of the insurrectionists came from South Jersey where there are a lot of hate groups, uh, but that's not just Jersey, they're all over the country. So yeah. go to the Southern Poverty Law Center, splcenter.org, and you can look at the map. It's kind of scary because I looked to see who was financing the insurrection and much to my dismay, I found that Fidelity, uh, Goldman Sachs, Schwab, Vanguard, all have charity divisions that contribute dark money through an organization called Donors Trust to some of the worst hate groups in the country. I was shocked. Wow. I thought Fidelity was a good company, but what I out is that these hate groups, uh, Koch brothers, Alex, several corporations like Exxon, Mobil, and such are donating through donors trust. That's the dark money that then goes to the hate groups. And what was frightening to see is that it's going to a group that many of us have not even heard of yet called V as in Victor, DARE, D-A-R-E, V DARE, all in caps. And that group has used money that they've gotten, dark money. They have bought an old castle just a little ways out of Washington, DC for a, a, a million and a quarter dollars. And they are planning a civil war there, the dare. 
a castle. This is not a conspiracy. This you can get from the Southern Poverty Law Center that they have bought a castle outside of Washington a little ways away where they meet. And they are one of the people who are behind the insurrection and the destruction of our government because it's white supremacy hate groups that are destroying the earth now. The entire yes. earth for all of them because of their ignorant hatred of different color skin. How crazy can you get just over a different color skin? As, as uh, Jean-Marie was saying earlier, it's absolutely insane, but there's so much we can do to educate others on these things because not even MSNBC or CNN ever mention the funders because they're also funded by the same funders that fund the hate groups. So you have to call the truth out or the Southern Poverty Law Center or sometimes Politico is good or Salon, but these are not television stations. The best television, is democracynow.org, Amy Goodman. Mm -hmm. But you can find mm -hmm. YouTube channels that tell truth, but you really have to search for who, where is the money? Follow the money. Mm -hmm. I'm that Garland, our new attorney general meant it when he said he was going to follow the money because unless we follow the money, we'll never win. I had a question for my wonderful friend, Dr. Glenn, Dr. Marion Glenn. I wanted to ask her about this cap and trade because I've heard about greenwashing. And unless I'm wrong, that people have accused cap and trade of greenwashing. You know what the new term greenwashing means, fake environmentalism, because they said it doesn't really reduce carbon in general. Am I so wrong? The, the, this, uh, re the regional greenhouse gas initiative was started by the governors of the Northeast states. Uh, and the idea was that they would, uh, they would put a cap on the amount of pollution that they would allow collectively from the states. Mm -hmm. And that cap would be lowered every year. And the, uh, you, if, if you were, uh, if your state was not able to meet the, the lower uh, amount, you could buy credits from a state that had a lower amount. So it, it, it's, it's a, an efficient way to, uh, it's, the, it's the way to get uh, to a lower number most efficiently. Because there, there are some, some states would have power plants that were too old uh, to, to really, um, reduce the, the amount of pollution, pollution that they had, or it would be too expensive to replace them. So they could continue to, uh, to pollute, but they have to pay uh, for the, that privilege. I understand. But the, total, the total amount of pollution goes down every year. In the whole, in the whole atmosphere? No. It would only. Well, the, no, the total amount that is being emitted by the states that are members of this group. Yes, but the total amount overall is going to stay just as bad. And that's what people are complaining about when it comes to cap and trade, I think. But I have another um, question about greenwashing being something we really have to watch out for because there are a lot of the phony. Uh, uh, I'll give you an example. So ExxonMobil just announced that they will be carbon neutral by 2030. Really? Uh, or 2050 or so, they, they made some statement, but let me tell you what they mean. So what, when, you, uh, when you talk about emissions, there are three types of emissions. There's the emissions that come from the, the business uh, of the company, that the company generates directly, uh, just by heating their buildings and by running their cars and that sort of thing. Uh, that's called scope one. Uh, scope two emissions, are emissions that uh, they are responsible for, but uh, let, let's say that, um, that they, they buy something that that has certain emissions and that they ha you have to account for, in other words, what, what it is that you're purchasing and the carbon footprint that that has. And then there are emissions that come by what you sell and what kind of emissions let, if you sell a gallon of gasoline, then that and that gasoline is burned, 
that that produces emissions. Yeah. So what Exxon has agreed to report and become neutral about is the operation of the company, but not these other uh, sort of indirect. Uh, so they're, they're not accounting for most of, of the, the carbon that they produce, which comes from what they sell. Yes, exactly. So that, that's, an, that's an example uh, of how Carbon reporting is more complicated than it might seem. Twenty and way too late for anything, for saving anything. Because the other thing that people are unaware of is that it takes a couple of centuries for all of that carbon to dissipate. It takes a hundred years for the carbon to dissipate. So yeah, that's what I was saying. That it, it that for for the first ten years, the carbon is still ramping up its ability to. Uh, to produce the warming. That was so interesting the way you explained yeah. that. But if yeah. you go to the concerned scientists, they have produced a chart as to where the most carbon emissions are coming from now in the world. Saudi Arabia is at the top, then Russia, then the United States. So, and then China also, but they have a whole chart of very interesting chart about who's producing the most emissions and the most fossil fuels. And they are part of this new climate integrity organization. Yeah, the Union of Concerned Scientists is an excellent organization. Uh, and they've got, uh, they, they've got data that really tells the story very well. Exactly my point, because they're working with the climate integrity organization, which is where the pay up climate polluters is located under that umbrella. And they use the Union of Concerned Scientists and environmental lawyers combined. And those where the, all the lawsuits are coming yeah. from with the data from the Union of Concerned Scientists and the lawyers from Earth Justice and other environmental lawyers all over the country. So we have about 28 or 21 litigations going now. Uh, against fossil fuel corporations. But the problem is that Saudi Arabia is still very <laughs> producing a lot of oil and making a lot of mess. And so is Russia and the United States as well and China. But so right now the United States is the largest oil producer mm -hmm. in the world. Unbelievable. Which Unbelievable. <laughs> I, I just heard Jill. I just Sorry, wanted ahead. to tell you something. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I know that we have um, I, at the schools, uh, elementary, middle, and high schools, they have a student Parsippany green team or student green team in Great. each of those different levels here in Parsippany. And obviously there's a teacher that has to step in and help run that. But that, right. that has been very positive and very, I mean, the, the, the kids... They just presented to the town council about meatless Mondays. Um, so the, the the young the young people seem to be the catalyst. Of course, we Agreed. have a, we have an excellent uh, science teacher. She has since retired, which really makes me very sad. But she same with Merle. Same with Merle, yeah. re retired <laughs> science teacher. Yep, love excellent it. Science. <laughs> Laura McCluskey. Laura McCluskey was the science teacher for the. Parsippany area and she um you know facilitated these 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 clubs and the three clubs and, and th I think that that is al although they're not teaching anything in the schools much to again both you and I much to our dismay th there is still outlets for these yeah. kids to find their way. So, so it's, that's what yeah, I think. We had, we had a, a group for many, many years in Newton High School called Students Against Violating the Environment, S-A-P. Oh. And Jill, do you know if that's still in existence? I've never even heard of it, Merle, and I was there oh, 16 ouch. and a half years ago. Yeah. I've been out for 11 years. I retired 11 yeah. years ago. What I find found so distressing, even back then, even in the early 2000s, even when I was trying to, to uh, show Al Gore's and Inconvenient Truth and discuss mm -hmm. topics, you would get students who would you know, almost parrot their parents, you know, whatever the political climate right. they were coming from. 
and right. ridiculing Al Gore, and and, and right. this is kind of what we're trying to do. And of course, right. she's in, 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 you know, it's it's very conservative right wing Sussex County. Very, very it was challenging. Um, but what was so encouraging was when you work with the students who were even back then just yes. going to work at these environmental issues. Yes. You know? And yes. That, yes. Now, you know, the point is, everybody, no matter what your political affiliation is, everybody wants to live in a clean Absolutely. environment. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. There, there are these yes. common things that, that should uh, that we should be able to agree on. It's yes. uh, yeah. politics. Excuse me, if I might say so. The problem is what we do personally now, no matter how great each of us is, is not enough to save the climate to the point of a habitable existence on earth. Mm -hmm. We still keep doing all our personal things, but we need political activism and yeah. national mm -hmm. levels, because no matter how wonderful each of us is or how wonderful each child is taught to behave in their own personal life, it's not gonna be enough to save the climate at this point. Right, you know, right. One of the things I keep noticing because I, you know, I left. Um, Merle and I used to work together at Newton High oh, School. You, when did you uh, leave? What, how long have you been? Uh, well, I was there. I was the high school nurse at Newton High School in Sussex County for sixteen and a right. half years, and I just resigned at the end of June because okay. I want to fight for climate justice. And I, the thing that I have become so aware of all of these gas stations that keep being built in New Jersey. I live in Sussex County, the tip, Northwest tip. I drive down to the Jersey shore and all of these gas stations are being built. And I'm saying, what in the heck is going on? How are we getting New Jersey green if they keep putting in new gas stations? Mm -hmm. What is going on here? I don't understand it. My husband and I have an electric car. We have solar. And what is going on with all of these, you know, all these, all these um, car companies are going in the electric direction so why are we building more gas stations i don't understand it what well, it comes down to is what danielle professor daniela was saying follow the money all the money all, all the about money. the money it, makes, it just it just fries my butter it just it just enrages me i i just don't get it i say that exxon Mobil and shell and all of those companies and the gas companies and the coal companies uh, who who are uh supporting a mansion. The mansion has right. special interests in coal. His whole family. And how is he a Democrat? How is he a Democrat? Because it was very hard for him to be any kind of a Democrat from the state he comes from. But the, right. iron, the coal miners were angry when he backed out of the Build Back Better. The coal miners want it. They don't like going down in the coal mines getting black. No. Yeah. So he's going against the people just to keep the profits from coal. Even Disgusting. the Virginia. I go on Twitter. There are all kinds of the uh, uh, images that say West Virginia needs build back better. West Virginia needs voting rights. He is the Amen. horrible, horrible hypocrite, along with cinema, who gets right. money in pharma. And that's right. why she won't go for build back better because she doesn't right. want to hear to be able to uh, get us lower drug prices. But I, I, I just wanna say that even though we can't let all of this discourage us, mm -hmm. right. realize that big money is behind politics. So following the yes. money. And that's why I wanted, another place that you might like to look into is corporateaccountability.org. And the Union of Concerned Scientists who are working with the climate integrity program, which is about making the polluters pay, working with the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, also, what was I going to say? I lost my train. But they are also saying that, um, what was I going to say? Well, I already told you about how Saudi Arabia and Russia are yeah. um, producing oil, I think. That's what the Union of Concerned Scientists chart. I just met with them this afternoon at three, but I'll try and find the link for you to go there because a lot of good information uh, from the Climate Integrity 
organization that is the umbrella, the nonprofit umbrella, so that the pay, make the people pay, make the climate polluters pay can be a little bit more political by being, um, you know, hiding under the umbrella of climate integrity, which is right. employers and the Union of Concerned Scientists. So they're a very, very prestigious and good organization. And I can, oh, the other, I know what it was I wanted to say. Dr. Glenn and I used to be going in person to public libraries. We went to Chatham Library. We went to Denville, was it? We went to various libraries. We were in Summit, Unitarian Universalist uh, Congregation. We were, um, we were about to be in Morristown when the pandemic hit. But if right. you the local libraries, different local library branches, the way our wonderful Jean-Marie has sponsored this, I think that Dr. Glenn and I would be willing to give more of these talks by Zoom. Great. Public library approach. And I used to live in Sussex County and I knew about the right-wing political co corruption up there. Oh boy. Yeah, big time. Oh boy. It is a beautiful <laughs> county though. Oh, it was, it's the last lands of the metropolitan area. And that's why we lived there. We had a little country cottage in Andover. Uh, yes. Lake, in Andover Forest Lake. Oh, I know your name. Wait a minute. I know you. I've known your name. I, I, yeah, I, I used to write for the little local things and be in, I used to work on climate crisis when I was up there in Sussex County. Uh, through through Sierra Club or through the Bird Club, the Bird Club. That's what. That's, just, <laughs> that's why you look familiar. I keep oh saying. Gosh, oh. I kept thinking the whole time. What do I know you from? I'm still. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, this is that's wonderful. great. <laughs> Love it. Wow. wow, that was my great. That was the great thing that happened to me. I heard you. Oh my goodness. More about me. I don't want to take over. I just have to ask you one question. Did you used to do the uh, the nationwide Audubon Christmas bird count there in Andover Township? And yes. Robert and I went with you when we first moved there. <laughs> right, when we first joined the club. Now, oh my, <laughs> wonderful things you are achieving. <laughs> oh, oh we love this. This is great. <laughs> this is yes. wonderful. You know what was I was still there and I can let me just say what was my hands. Let me say what was wonderful about the bird club is you learned all about nature from them. Yes. They talked about the plants, the trees, what the birds fed on, how they yes. to eat grapes or seeds. They knew everything about nature. And what was weird is a few of them were very right wing. And I never <laughs> Oh, together. they still are. We have no pun intended. Very right, right wing. Very right wing. Right wing. Right wing. <laughs> right. We, we don't understand. There are. It makes absolutely no sense to us. But you're absolutely right. And I think just because it's the Sussex County, you know, the bulk the of the population that they, I don't know, they can't see out of the way. It, it, their their big argument is, don't you dare take away our guns, and it's all based on that. Right. We want to we want to kill the bear. Don't don't say we can't. Well, guess what? They weren't able to do that this 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 uh, bear hunting season. Thank God for that. The Thank guy God for that. Club who used to feed the bears, and they would cross the highway to get his, the food he was putting out, which he wasn't supposed to do. He would feed the bear donuts, and they would come across the highway and get killed by cars. And he was in the bird club. But I was with Dick and Linda Moore. You knew Dick and yes. Linda when Dick was president. He was more on our progressive page. And she Dick was, Wilson. I forgot their last name. I haven't seen Dick Wilson. Dick Wilson. He was Wilson. one of us. He was more <laughs> he really loved nature. And he had beautiful photography of birds out of this world. His pictures of bald eagles and various raptors. I saw a kestrel yesterday right here in Maplewood. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard, I heard um, a very rare uh, hermit thrush last spring here. Wow. That's wonderful. Wow. Wow. You know, uh, in my, probably in migration, heading for New England. Yeah. York State. We get yeah. plenty of Canada geese, of course. Believe it or not, they were once on the endangered list. 
<laughs> so things can come back. But that's good. A, a southern species that made its way north. It used to be only in the south. The cardinal. Now it's all over here. It adapted to the winters of the northeast. Sure. For the uh, the red-bellied woodpecker. Yes, yeah. and the birds are the canary in the coal mine, and half of them are gone already. Actually, half of all the world's wildlife is already extinct, more than half. Yep, mm. yep it's terrible. But we have to keep hope alive. Keep yeah, hope and alive. I, I love, Danielle, I love the positive optimism that that's so important because people don't want to sit and work for something that's so depressing. It's just, they feel there's no hope. Right. And I just, that is such a great, just such a great approach to take. It's a very good approach. And book. I really feel it's, it's going to be the young people. It, it's going to be the Greta Thunbergs. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I have participate. And Greta gets angry that there aren't enough of us oldies. And I'm 81. And I'm I was at it from when I first heard, wrote, read The Greenhouse Effect, which came even before Bill McKibben's book. Remember The Greenhouse Effect way back in Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. that was the first book. Then came Bill McKibben, The End of Nature, which I gave to all uh, stepchildren and children at the time because they were grown up enough to read that. But mm -hmm. uh, really, do need to keep everyone involved, and more senior citizens should be involved. Now, I just want to say I live in Winchester Gardens in Maplewood, which is a senior community. And I'm pretty disgusted with the fact that I only find a few seniors who care. And you know what they say? Oh, that's up to the young people. And I have to tell them, you made the mess. Clean up your own mess. Don't leave it. Exactly. Exactly. And Ella, Danielle, let me tell you, I want to tell all of you about a new nonprofit nationwide. It's called S-S-A-F-E. Senior Stewards Acting for the Environment. And the slogan is, we are green, we're gray, and we're not going away. Oh, I love it. Love it. So wait, so That's wait, great. Merle. Merle, was, can you repeat that? S-S-A-F? S-S-A-F-E. E. Okay. Senior, yeah, but... senior stewards acting for the environment. And um, we are living in a senior community here. And this, this, we just moved in last year and this thing just began in the past year and we now have nonprofit status and there are 10 different senior communities between all over the country that we are linked with. And so- Chester Gardens linked with Now, Merle, you put it in the chat, but you made the chat personal for only you and I can't make it for everyone or they could see what you put in the chat. Right. And, and, well, that, that was when I first heard you talk, I thought, oh, you must come and talk because oh, we in the chat and say everyone because you locked it for just so I couldn't write to everyone. I could only write to you. Can I'm you go back and chat, Merle, and free it for everyone? I can do that. Yeah, I, I'll do that now. Okay, Jill, Jill, just put it in there. Jill, well, so just put it in there. Senior. Senior. senior acting for the environment. Stewards, I can't. Forever. Just, okay, we have a we have an advocacy uh, team. Um, we they even there was even one um, march from this is before we even moved here and came here. So I did, I wasn't part of the group then, but they actually march and drove from um, Scranton, Pennsylvania, to Wilmington, Delaware. You know, Joe wow. Biden, Wilmington. And where they and, and on the way they stopped and spent time in Chester outside of Philly, meeting with um, community leaders about the environmental justice issue and so on. And um, when they finally landed in uh, Wilmington, they gathered outside the Chase Bank headquarters, and they put a whole bunch of rocking chairs in this busy intersection. <laughs> the just put themselves there, and it, it was go into the chat and free it. So we could see all the information you put there because I, I, had, I wish I'd been there, but I just want to say they're out to see their education and they're doing, I'll do it right now. The reason is you locked it into just you and I cannot free it for everyone. I okay, keep here we go. And it won't go to everyone. Hmm. Clicking to everyone. Somehow the chat is stuck on 
It won't go into everyone. It can't go into everyone. So let's see if it works. <laughs> Sorry. I just wanted everyone to see your information. That's all right. It's okay. Can, I can think we've that? all written it down. But I want to yeah. give you the, um, our website is, is oh, shoot. Everything. Yeah. So, I was gonna the, oh, good. I didn't that's make okay. It. That's okay. Yeah. Put the website. Senior stewards <laughs> acting for the environment. And for the website, you can just go ssafe.org. Sure. Dot. I was yeah. a slide yeah. here. <laughs> um, or you can write the whole um, senior stewards acting for the environment.org. The, the website tells it all. Um, but Daniela, if you would consider um, being a Zoom speaker for one of our general meetings, and you'd be speaking to a very vibrant, active group. I mean, these people, everyone, most people are retired, not everyone, but most. Uh, and yet they are just um, as, as vibrant as you and Marion are, as far as their commitment and what they're trying to achieve. Sure. Well, so we you would have you have both of their emails in the chat, yeah, right? Both your yeah. emails and Marion is famous. Oh, you can't see the chat because you have to go to the three little dots, pull down the menu, and say everyone. Well, that's what right. I did. And, oh, you did. Yeah. The only she reason did. I didn't do that for you, Daniela, is because I I. What you were speaking when I typed it, and I was just inspired to quick send you a message. Okay. I think. Phil Listen, got everybody. I, I have to go. So love to you all. This was Thank you, phenomenal. Jill. All I right. will be emailing everybody because okay. I need you all to help me with this Tennessee gas pipeline nonsense that needs to be stopped. So okay. thank you. Stay safe and well. And I just applaud every single one of you. Thank you all for all you do. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Right back. Thank, you, Jill. Jill. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marion and Danielle, thank you so much. Thank you both so much. I, I really, really enjoyed the program. Um, uh, and I'm going to put this on the, on the, on YouTube. I'll probably stop it. I probably won't put all the conversation that we just had. You know, the, I'll figure <laughs> out how to do that. <laughs> um, but everyone have a good evening. Professors, thank you very much. And I'll be in contact with pleasure. you again to do Great another audience. program for us. Yes. All right. Good. Thank you for your commitment. Yeah. Thank you. Next time. Bye. All right. I love you, Marion. Take good care. Stay you safe. You too, Daniela. All right. Be well, both of you. Thank you, Jean-Marie. Thank you.